Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of artists, performers and rock stars of life. My guest today is an actor, director, writer and producer. He has appeared in multiple TV series, films and theatre productions. The Crown, Patrick Melrose, Line of Duty, Defending the Guilty, 10%, Dr. Foster, to name but a few. On stage, he has further acting credits with the RSC, the Donmar Warehouse and the Young Vic. He writes for the stage, for the screen, and is a published author. This autumn, 2023, we will be able to see a production he's written, a feature film he's directed, and a new series he's acting in. Unlike most actors, acting is his second career, as he was formerly a junior medical doctor, so he truly is multi-talented. He read medicine at New College Oxford, and it is thanks to New College that I am speaking to him today. I am delighted to be talking to Prasanna Puanaraja. Hi, Prasanna. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be talking to you. You come from a medical family. Your mother was a psychiatrist, your father a dentist. Did you feel as you were growing up that your future was, for want of a better word, prescribed? No, not at all, actually. I mean, my parents uh, are medical, as you say. They they worked in very specific areas of of medicine. So my mum was a a community psychiatrist, essentially. She worked in care of the elderly, psychiatry for the elderly. And then latterly, she worked in dependency psychiatry, which is essentially the care of people who have um, alcohol and drug dependency conditions alongside psychiatric conditions. And close to her retirement, she was actually doing that work in prisons. So it was a very, very specific area that she worked in. And dad was a dentist in the NHS. He worked in the NHS his whole career, which, as you know, is a very unusual thing, increasingly, to find dentists in the NHS. And he worked in a, a practice in Southampton, part of Southampton called Shirley, which is um, close to the docks and city centre. It's a sort of inner city dental practice. So in a sense, both of them were quite kind of community embedded, I would say. Both careers were very successful, I guess, engine room NHS careers. But I don't think they were necessarily easy careers for a number of reasons. They're both sort of challenging workplaces that they were both in. And plus the fact that they were essentially trying to build careers as migrants from Sri Lanka. So they, I think there there was a lot of kind of running to stand still and catching up that needs to be done. So I don't think for them, medicine felt like a particularly straightforward thing to be doing. It was the thing that yielded its fair share of kind of quite deep challenges, I think. And I, I, it wasn't what I wanted to do at all. First up, I wanted to be an architect until I was about 15 or 16. Really? Yeah, that was the plan. So I didn't really entirely know what it was, but I was fascinated by buildings. I was fascinated by spaces, public spaces, how they worked, how they didn't work, stadiums, shopping centers, things like, you know, I was sort of always weirdly intrigued by how people functioned in large-scale civic buildings, how those buildings functioned, how they decanted people into back into the world at the end of things. Yeah, and, and someone at my school, a careers advisor at my school, said that, that you had to be good at physics to be an architect, which, of course, you know, is not the case at all. But, it, you know, for someone who didn't really have a second person to check with, you know, that was really kind of the end of that. And I guess I was sort of looking to, I, I'd always been interested in sciences at school from quite a young age, actually. From sort of 12, 13, I was interested in how atoms worked and how the solar system worked and, you know, sort of trying to give a shape to the things around us. And, um, and I found the humanities quite daunting, actually. I found them so, I found them very loose, actually, in the way that they were presented to me, particularly when I was sort of in the first kind of, I guess, like 11, 12, 13, 14, I found it very hard to grasp onto. They seem to require, for me anyway, some sort of like inherited cultural understanding of like the landscape in which those things were coming out of. I didn't really know anything about the things that people around me seemed to know about, like, you know, what the word society meant and who Charles Dickens was and what happened in the Second World War. And, you know, because we just said that wasn't really my family's lineage, I guess. And so in that sense, my family's sort of educational inheritance was absolutely scientific. And so that's the bit that I kind of knew was to be familiar. But I didn't really want to kind of just study a science. Uh, I found them quite abstract in that way. And, and so medicine was a thing that gave it a kind of 
locality and a sort of reality. So I did some work experience. I think my folks at that time were quite, they weren't actually particularly pro me being a doctor. I, I would say for a person who came from, as you say, a medical family, it was a kind of non-traditional circuitous route back to medicine, I think. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, you were a member of the National Youth Theatre, which yeah. um, I know my daughter's tried for years to 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 get in and it's i mean it is a feat in itself because it's there's so many people who go for it and so for such few places and i think you're a trustee now aren't you i am i'm actually the vice chair of the national youth theater which is um my goodness sort of strange <laughs> that sounds very important <laughs> well it does doesn't it? It, it it's absolutely not but um I, I started very late actually i remember getting told off on a few occasions when I was a teenager by various people for not participating in the arts. Um, a teacher told me off for not signing up for a school trip to the theatre. I remember my dad being very cross one day when he discovered a permission slip in my trousers that had gone through the laundry to go and see Les Mis in London. And he didn't, he didn't know what Les Mis was. He didn't know really what what any what if any sort of significance that had in the kind of like I guess popular cultural landscape in this country but um he knew that it was me being flippant about opportunities I think so yeah I just it wasn't really I was into sports and I was into kind of video games and so yeah and I was quite shy and retiring and so the theatre was not really a kind of expression space that I particularly understood so I got into it very late. I, I, I was sort of, I had to, I was forced to be in a play at school because it was such an enormous cast and they were basically just like everyone has to be in it. And I, and I loved it. It was um, an amazing experience. But that was when I was about 16, I think. So it was very, very late on relative to most people who I've met since who want to work in, in acting and directing who very often sort of knew it from when they were four. And then I applied to the National Youth Theatre, and at, at which point I was going to medical school. And I think really, frankly, I think the, the reason that they were interested in me for that was because at that time I, I sort of didn't want to be an actor. And I think that was quite unusual for people applying for the National Youth Theatre, who at that, that time really was the kind of place that, you know, aspiring actors went or tried to get into um, as a kind of alternative route into the industry. I would say now the National Youth Theatre is much more interested in what creativity uh, and the spirit of storytelling can offer any young person in any journey in life, whether it's into the arts or alongside or completely distinct from, that it's a way of opening up a, a young person's kind of spirit to connect with the world in a way that is sort of on their terms. So it's a much more pleasingly non-specific charitable function now, I think. Whereas before it was kind of a summer theatre club, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I, I did that the year after I finished my A-level, so the year between school and medical school. And I loved it. And I, I really was like quite dazzled by how connected I felt to this sort of parish of weirdos. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what, I kind of, I've, I've kind of always felt that artists and actors are a kind of collective of strange and wonderful spirits. And I felt the immediate ability to express who I thought I was at that point without fear of shame or kind of reprisal. It was just an environment that I immediately knew I wanted to be in and around. And so when I was at medical school, I just did plays. I didn't do them because I, most, a lot of the time I didn't do them because I was interested in the play even. I was just interested in the, the act of making something collectively, the act of a kind of, exploratory process of some kind, you know, the live real-time exploration of human behavior, just sort of what theatre is, I think, for me. Yeah, so it, all, it, it was all sort of happening very kind of accidentally. You know, there was no kind of grand scheme. But so, yeah, I probably did maybe 15, 20 plays or something when I was at um, medical school. I did, um, so three years of pre-clinical medicine at New College and then another three years of clinical school where I was a graduate student at New College, essentially, but at the John Ratcliffe Hospital. So we kind of had digs in the, on the Cowley Road and um, later on way up, actually way up the Cowley Road. But um, And then when I was working the first couple of years as a junior doctor, I did in the John Ratcliffe Hospital. So I lived up in Headington 
various sort of versions of hospital accommodation and lived in North Oxford for a bit. So so I was in Oxford for a total of eight years, six of which was, was medical school. I wanted to go to a university rather than a medical school. I wanted to go somewhere where I would meet people and philosophies that weren't medical. You find that a lot among medical people that they do have interests outside of medicine that I think at some point they just have to relinquish, you know, because of the nature of that job. I'm amazed that you had time to do any plays actually at at Oxford or at, at medical school because I was there about a decade before you. And at that point, nobody was working terribly hard, except the medics. They were working really hard, even then. Yeah. So What's, what subject did you do? I did maths, extremely poorly, as it turned <laughs> out. <laughs> I did it really well until after A-level, just after A-level. Yeah. And then it all went to rubbish. And then you hit, you hit your ceiling. <laughs> I hit my ceiling and I also yeah. hit the bar, the new college yeah. bar. So it, the uh, several, the the several time, events yeah. happened <laughs> that just colla- made everything collapse. How did you find being there? Well, I loved it. I mean, I I, I think um, I feel quite unusual sometimes in saying that. Not necessarily in college, but like I, I think people have very mixed experiences at university, and and I feel so lucky that mine was um, so warm and kind of um, filled with lovely friends and memories. And and actually, the truth is, I I really enjoyed the work. You know, uh, and I I we did a lot of work. Whenever you'd walk in to college from a morning of labs or something, you'd sort of see that. English students standing around in their pants and, and <laughs> they, 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 they sort of look at you like you're kind of Shackleton, you know, re- returning yeah. from... <laughs> I know. Um, um, and um, people were quite intrigued to chat to you at lunchtime because they would just, they'd just been knocking around college, you know, not really doing anything. Sort of one semi-panicked essay crisis a week and we were just full-time. We were full-time in the faculty. We would do at least two quite significant essays a week up to seven at one point in the second year in a moment of um i wouldn't say uncharacteristic idleness my my friend jonathan and i calculated that the first year of medicine at oxford was the equivalent of about 50 a levels just in terms of content yeah but still you then went and acted well that's sort of why you act i guess because otherwise you just completely lose it. I mean, I, I think, and also I just, I, I never had any big parts or anything at, at university and uh, certainly early on. And so I would just mainly just sit in the dressing room and do the work, you know, and then wander on stage and stand at the back of something and wander off and just, I found it a really lovely way to sort of focus the work into like little pockets. And actually, even now I do that. Like sometimes if I'm writing something and if I'm working as an actor at the same time, I'll absolutely sort of go into a theatre in the afternoon, write for three or four hours in the afternoon, do the show in the evening, and then come home. And I think there's something about that that is really a, a working practice, I guess, from back in the days. We had very supportive tutors. The, the four tutors that interviewed the four of us to get into New College for Medicine, we were the kind of first quartet of medics that they admitted. And actually, when we went back there, all four of us, for our kind of 20-year anniversary, they were all retiring they that that was the end of their kind of period so we were very fond of them and and they were they were fond of us too i think and in a kind of eye rolling way i mean we all had our <laughs> you know <laughs> stuff that we did and stuff that we didn't do and you know but um we gave it a, a good go i think like we, we we yeah and um i i found it intriguing i never i actually genuinely never thought of myself as a scientist i mean oxford medicine is very much a kind of it's a thing that leans into research and leans into primary science as opposed to medical schools that have a very distinct focus on patient care and hospital-based medical practice, which actually weirdly I think would have suited me better in terms of learning actual medicine. I, I sort of think of like people who train to be roadside mechanics, like you have to do that at the roadside. And roadside medicine, I think would probably have been better for me because there's a lot of medicine that shouldn't be as complicated as it's made out to be. So I was surprised to discover that I actually just, I loved the deep, deep, deep dive into the science. And actually the first couple of years of medicine is just this blizzard of information. And it's information not really at depth. It, it's examined It's examined in short note form. So write short notes on, you know, the pacemaker mechanism of the heart or the, the cells of the retina or something, you know. And you only have to write five or six 
elements things about that thing to get the tick and pass that question. So you need to know a tiny bit about absolutely everything, which is a horrible, horrible way to learn for me. There was a guy, I can't remember his name, but he wrote a book of medical mnemonics. So for example, Get Smashed is the mnemonic that gives you the possible causes of pancreatitis. And it's like, oh God, I don't know why I chose that. I'm never going to remember it. G is for gallstones. E is for ETOH, which is alcohol. Uh, T is for trauma. S is for, I mean, hilariously, scorpion oh. venom. <laughs> still in my head, you know. Um, that That's the problem with medical school. You remember scorpion venom and you stood there in A&E going, could this be scorpion venom? And it's, of course, it's not. It's, <laughs> you know? So it doesn't actually tell you the sensible thing you need to know, which is what is it likely to be? And why? Why is it likely to be that? You know, how do you look for the most likely thing is never really have it. So you'd have kind of ward rounds where you'd just be reeling off these lists of inanimate realities that are unrelated to the person in front of you. And I found that very hard because I just couldn't keep, I couldn't, other than that random mnemonic that I just stated there, I just couldn't tag them to anything. It was just this, this untethered, nebulous mind map of kind of, you know, stuff. But so when we got into the third year and we were doing the kind of the degree the sort of intercalated degree element of the course, which is aside from the GMC required bit of the course, then it really changed and it became like a small kind of window of material studied in very, very great depth. And I was doing a lot of plays at that time. I spent about six months, I think, at that point. I did two whole terms where I just didn't go to a lecture. I didn't do an essay. I did a bit of theatre. I just sort of knocked about really and I said well I'll get to January of the finals year and I'll just give that six month period to, to the work and basically just l- discovered I, I don't know it was amazing really but I discovered that I really loved the work for six months or so I didn't do any theatre at all and then I then got a part in a university tour to Japan which was amazing but I couldn't go because it clashed with the start of medical school the head of the medical school was like, no, you can't go. And I was like, I'll make up all the time. I'll do it all again. And she was like, no, you can't. Here's your medicine. I was like, fair enough. There wasn't a conversation about it. You know, I walked into her office and she just said, before you sit down, the answer is going to be no. It was interesting later on when I was a junior doctor. Um, so I directed a play in my fifth year that an agent saw and sort of said, you need to think really carefully about this because you are good at this you know which was like a really unhelpful thing to <laughs> like it was you know um and then i did a play radio play that i got through the national youth theater about six months later and he randomly had this agent randomly heard it on radio four and he sort of rang and said i didn't realize you were an actor as well and i was like well i'm not really you know i'm just like finally a medical student and he went well let's, let's like punt you in for some auditions and so i did an audition tape i got this part in this this two-part miniseries that would shoot for two weeks in Morocco, in the first six months of my job as a junior doctor. And I was like, that's never going to happen. And my consultant, Maggie Hammersley, at the time, I sort of mentioned it. She was like, we have to do that. You have to do that. And I said, well, I do have a plan. And the plan is that I would take unpaid leave. And we were on these very complicated, strict rotor patterns. So I was like, it's going to really like leave a hole in the rotor, you know, in a very specific place. And I was like, I will pay for the locum doctor to fill that hole. And she was like, I've got a better idea. There's a student in the final year who has had a family bereavement in the last 12 months and has missed a lot of medical medical school, but they're a very, very capable medical student. And so I want to give them a student locum. So we will countersign their prescriptions that they write and they can cover that two weeks as the junior doctor on the ward. And I was like, okay, brilliant. Great. Great. Yeah. And um, which is sort of what didn't happen at the start of clinical school. You know what I mean? Yes. And so I went off to Morocco and did this thing. And I came back and they were really disappointed to see me. <laughs> this student <laughs> locum had been amazing. And they were like, oh, great, you're back. Um, and then I just sort of had this like weird period of like four years where it was way before self taping. And this agent would sort of very occasionally go, I've got this audition for you for this thing. And I'd be like, Obviously, I can't do that. There's no way I'm going to be able to do a four-month job, you know, in Wales. I am currently a visiting fellow uh, on a thing called a Dummett Fellowship, which is um, a new fellowship. So I go to college like once a term, if I can, and um, do a session with 
usually medical students, but sometimes it's a slightly bigger group. And my primary interest in those sessions is about careers because of the immense pressures on medical staff, which are heightened massively by the political pressures around the NHS, particularly post-pandemic, but definitely pre-pandemic as well. The burnout is just colossal. And um, so people are trying to find ways to stay because, of course, it's something that they really love and they want to do. But um, increasingly, it feels hard for people to know how they're going to make it mentally, you know, or just in terms of how your family life is going to work. And, you know, does your desire to perform a vocational duty meet a support mechanism that can kind of allow it? And the answer is increasingly no. And I think like what I want to do in those conversations is to essentially release people from the sense that the first thing that they do after college or university is going to be the thing that they have to do and commit to and that it's a long life and that you'll find new directions and you'll make new friends and things will not be set in stone in the way that I think we all certainly felt as 20-year-olds that you could really screw up if you made the wrong call coming out and that the stakes were really high and they're just not. And I think it was very unfashionable to say that at the time when I was a student, particularly in medicine, I think. It's an interesting sort of space to be talking in, I think, professionally. Basically, it's a fellowship in how not to have a medical career on the basis that, you know, most medics will. It's just good to know that it's a big world out there if you need it. Well, I think that releases the pressure enormously to know that you have an out. The damage to the self is high. People can cope with rewards not being high. It's never really why anyone goes into medicine. But I think when the landscape of professional practice becomes so kind of toxic and the narrative around your professional life is sort of inflected with this quite grim political dimension, then the fact that you're really you know, you're working in a space that doesn't always reward the psychological injury, the time, the labor, the -the off-the-clock labor, which is colossal in the NHS. You know, the the NHS would struggle overnight if people started working to contract. So, you know, all of those things require a certain amount of understanding that that's what people are really putting out there. And the pandemic was the perfect time for us to register that nationally. And for various reasons, I think we've nationally sort of failed to. Yeah. So I think there's a kind of understandable sort of spiritual blackout in the NHS where people are just feeling this kind of sense of disconnect, I think, from the nation that they serve, which is the last place you want to be as a healthcare professional. So, and that's a fundamentally, that's a, that's a political wound that's been imparted on the health service, I think. So, yeah, I think that's um, it's a massive challenge. It's a massive challenge. Um, and, that, of course, the blame is laid at the door of healthcare professionals leaving. But, um, you know, you sort of leave things that you know are injuring you. I think that's really fundamental. You know, no one's got, you know, bottomless reserves. But was that why you left? It was why I stepped away, yeah, because I just found it so crushingly difficult to kind of... I, I, I sort of had this sense of dread going in every day. I think on the face of it, and I've, I've spoken to people who since then who I worked with who never really realised this about me because I think I was very good at hiding it, putting on a putting on a kind of quite calm front. But uh, I got a an eight year training post in reconstructive surgery in the John Radcliffe, and I was and I and I just couldn't really imagine day one of that just walking in the same doors of that place and i think i probably should have gone to like orkney or somewhere and just been a gp you know and um <laughs> uh, because i mean my my favorite attachments really in, in medical school were, were, were general practice i did a two-week attachment in a rural practice in wiltshire which i just loved i think that would have been a, a really lovely way to kind of execute a medical career, I think. But I mean, even now, general practice is, it's, it's so difficult, I think, for, for those guys. It's, it's, it's incredibly hard. And um, 
local services are so asset stripped that um, you know it becomes a kind of place where people just arrive, understandably so enraged as well as angry, you know, as, as as unwell. But yeah, I, I you know, uh, so I was sort of like in these in the hospital environment, finding it incredibly hard. So I asked the surgical deanery, which is the sort of institution within higher education of doctors administering surgical training, whether I could just do take a, a, a year off program, unpaid, of course, and just sort of a sabbatical, essentially. And it was reconstructive surgery, and they weren't short of people who wanted to do that post so that, you know, there's not like a, an unfilled space somewhere, you know, it was very much like, okay, we'll just one of these other people will be, um, will, will, will take that post. And I immediately felt this sort of weight lift. And um, because it, medicine runs on the academic calendar, it's another weirdly infantilizing <laughs> quality to it. But, but so, you know, really, you're, you're, you're running August to August until you're in your late 30s, probably. And they were trying to work out their recruitment for next August, three or four months into that year. And I was like, I'm I'm not ready to tell you whether I want to come back in August, which is, of course, an indication that I wasn't. So one year immediately became two, and and I moved on to my sister's sofa. She was living uh, on the Isle of Dogs in East London. I was really grateful for her to sort of um, extend out that sort of net. <laughs> yes, um, and I just sort of started watching fringe plays, and I locumed a bit. I sort of basically lived out of my car. And uh, drove around and did like two month, three month, four month posts, places like Bristol and Eastbourne, and I, I just sort of pick them on the basis of how friendly they felt, you know. And I actually enjoyed those two years of like doing. I mean, probably in the twenty four months of the second two years of my medical practice, I probably worked for eighteen of those twenty four months in hospitals. Um, but I worked all all round and it was the variety, I think, and the kind of like never having to sort of embed fully, <laughs> you know, my generally sort of avoidant nature, I think was quite satisfied by that. Um, but yeah, and so I, but there was no part of me that wanted to get back into that, that trench, you know. And so eventually I asked the dean, I sort of said like, look, I know I've been like rolling this thing, but like, it's just I'm going to step away from it, um, and if I want to come back, I'll just reapply for that job. You know? And they were like, "No, it's fine. We'll just keep it open for you, like just whenever you want to come." And I was like, "It's not helpful. Not helpful. I don't. I, the safety net is not the thing." So, in the end, I'd done half of the postgraduate surgical exams, and I needed to kind of attempt is the word the final part within a certain time frame after passing the second bit. I mean, you can literally go there and like turn up, sit there for. 20 minutes, which is the minimum amount of time, I think, and walk out, get 0%, and that's fine. You just sort of, the clock resets. But I was like, I don't want to, why am I doing that, you know? And I thought about doing a kind of crash course and trying to pass the exam. And I was just like, I just don't want it. I don't want that life. You know, I don't want to go back to that life. I just knew it so clearly. And when the the expiry date of that exam came and went, and it expires in a way that's like, not only... It's not that you have to go back and do the first set of exams again. That's it. You the the wall, the the door bricks up behind you. There is you will not ever go back into that. I felt this kind of clarity. I felt this sort of um, straightforwardness about the journey ahead at that point. And did you know the journey ahead at that point was going to include acting, or just just the fact that it was it was just the fact that the wall could close behind you was helpful? Yeah, it's the second thing. I mean, I was I was like trying to get that agent to wake up a bit. I mean, he completely lost interest in me by that stage. So uh, understandably. Um, and so, yeah, I was trying to like write and I wanted to make some short films and there was a play that I wanted to direct. And there were, there were a few like little bits and pieces that I was interested in doing, but none of it really had a plan or a kind of, you know, strategy. But then, you know, I think a career is sort of what happens next rather than, you know, what you want to do or what, what your plan is for 15, 20 years time. You know, a career is like just what's happening now. And in retrospect, it's what has, you know, what it's been. Uh, it's sort of somewhere between those two things. And so, yeah, I, I think like if I went and talked to a bunch of medical students now and went, this is how it's gone, 
I couldn't predictably tell them how to do that journey because it would just be different now for them. And, you know, so yeah, and that was kind of 13 years ago. And since then, it's just been a kind of, it's been a life in the circus, really. And that period of time between that wall bricking up and you getting your first break, were there ever any moments in there where you thought, oh, made the wrong decision or? No, never. I mean, there were times when it was hard and and still even now, but they're difficult in the service of something that I know feels like a way that I enter the world kind of happily, I suppose, or as happily as I can. And it's not always happy. It's very, it's challenging in different ways, but um, in ways that I feel like I understand that I know how to set about managing or to, to try and calibrate defenses and I guess strategies to cope with. Whereas I just didn't have that with the NHS. I didn't know how to build a mechanism of coping around that thing. I went into management consultancy and right. I do remember it being all consuming and never been having any control of my life and being on a bus and thinking, if I could just run under a bus, have a little bit of an accident and, and um, you know, and then I have three weeks in hospital and I wouldn't have to go to work. And I, that was the moment where I thought, yeah. I think... I think you're thinking so wrongly about, yeah. <laughs> about life here. Yeah, it's just, yeah, you know, maybe absolutely. this yeah, isn't that's a huge, for you. That's a huge career red flag, isn't it? When you're like, maybe you should go on this bus. <laughs> I'd love to talk about a handful of your roles. You've had some very high profile ones. Um, You were the partner to Dr. Foster. You were in Patrick Melrose, where you played Benedict Cumberbatch's best friend, Johnny. I watched that series and it was harrowing viewing, incredibly dark. How did that come about? That was just an audition that came up. Really rare example, actually, for me of um, scripts that arrived just ready to shoot. You know what I mean? They were already brilliant. And I had not encountered the novels, actually. Um, so I didn't know the Patrick Melrose books. I didn't know Edward St. Aubyn's work. And I also thought, where, why, what rock have I been under? Like, have I missed this, you know? And um, yeah, just went along for an audition. Then later on met Ed Berger, who directed it. And um, yeah, I mean, I'd, um, I, th- I think it's just that thing with auditioning where you you, you sometimes kind of, have to just go along to things do your best work and just forget about them and you know they, they, they kind of they vanish back to the obscurity that they came from you know and try not to feel too terrible about it when they don't go your way <laughs> and stuff and, and very occasionally some of them do and that was sort of one of those ones yeah and you're also in Defending the Guilty, which is a comedy about a yeah. set of chambers um, dealing with criminal law, and you are one of the lead actors. Ingrid Oliver, who were, is a fellow New College alumnus and also a guest on this on this show, she appears in it um, from time to time. And she said that there is a lightness of touch in comedy acting that you can't really teach. And then when I spoke to Sally Phillips about that, she said, no, 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 you, I really think you can teach that. What do you think? That's really interesting. I've done quite a bit of comedy, but I don't think I'd ever sort of think of myself as a a specialist or like particularly a person with an insight. I mean, I think like comedy is probably sort of like people who have a natural ability with a football or something, you know, that I think some people, you can get better at it, but some people can just kind of do it. I mean, there are just funny people all over the world who've never been anywhere near like a, a thing that would, make them consider why they're funny um and a lot of people who are apparently funny really aren't but you can but you can you can hear the engine running you can see all the pumps and bellows going all the little lights are flashing but they're just not funny maybe it's a sort of combination of honing a thing that an ear that a person might naturally have for it it can be very very hard to make people who don't have that muscle funny Continuing the theme of funny, but you are also in 10%, which for those who don't know it, is a British version of Call My Agent. And I have to say, I was hooked. I thought I watched a couple of episodes and I binge watched the whole of it. It was so brilliant. And and even down to the, the guest actors who play themselves um, and what a lineup you had. And uh, the repartee is so quick unusually quick, even for comedy. And I wondered how much of that is improvised versus scripted. Well, none of it was improvised. It was uh, John Morton who wrote W1A and um, 2012 uh, was the writer showrunner. And he has the most miraculous ear for what he calls um, 
he calls them sort of um, system noises. You know, the kind of little, the little bumps and scrapes that happen in a conversation where people are just trying to work out what's going on. And it's all completely scripted and sort of, if you take any of it out, it all just sort of doesn't work. So you've just got to, basically, it's a, it's a kind of learn it really well and carefully, listen really hard and just go for it kind of thing and um it was like that was a cast sort of packed full of lovely people who were genuine funnies i mean people like harry trevaldwin and rebecca Humphreys, who are comedy savants really i mean they're just like as, as jack davenport uh, put it they just people who seem to kind of understand comedy via a different set of antennae you know but yeah i mean so many people love that show so many people love that show including and sometimes in particular people who love the french show um, the two kind of went hand in glove in a very like unobtrusive, non-violent way. <laughs> so we were kind of devastated when we found out that the show wasn't going to continue. But, you know, I, I sort of live in perpetual hope with that one. I think it, I, of all the things I've done, it feels like the thing that most wanted to kind of keep living. It's got a kind of warmth and loveliness to it, I think, that maybe we all need a bit more of nowadays. And um, so... You know, who knows? Fingers crossed. Oh, well, I hope so, because I went straight from episode 10 to thinking, well, where's season two? <laughs> so I was like, well, where oh, is well. it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, okay. you know, write to Amazon, write to Amazon. You know, I might, I line. think I might do that. <laughs> I might do that. And in it, you play Dan, the agent who falls in love with the beautiful receptionist turned actor. And, um, and in it, and I read an interview that you have actually been sacked by two agents in real life. <laughs> so what what do we conclude from that? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, I guess that whole process was um, illuminating for like, trying to understand why agents choose to work with people, why those relationships succeed or don't. You know, I think like th- there's something about agents letting you go that, really clarify where you are in your career you know they're not saying i hate you or i think you're like hopeless at your job they're basically saying i don't know how to help you anymore and i don't think what you are what you do chimes well enough with what i think i can achieve for you and the good ones at that stage do let you go the bad ones sort of hang on to you and you kind of find people just ossifying on these lists hoping that one day their agent's going to pull it out of the bag for them. But actually their agent has sort of left the station a long time ago. And it's really unfair and, and dishonest to those actors and writers and things. But it also means when you do finally meet the agent who is right for you, you do really recognize it. You recognize that they're not really there depending dependent on how good your last job was or whether you have earning power or any of those. They're, they're in it because they sort of, I guess I've always thought of it as like, they they feel like they know a secret about you that, they want everyone to know. And that secret doesn't really go away. So yeah, um, it was, um, it's been useful. I know people who've been, you know, they signed with an agent out of drama school and stayed with them for 30 years. And that's kind of the other way. But I mean, that really is a marriage and that's going to go in through its ups and downs and stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's they're challenging relationships because, you know, careers are not linear. And so you really do find out who kind of stepped out with you for the right reasons and who kind of stepped out with you because they thought they could sort of maybe sell you for a bit or whatever, you know. Yeah. At the end of that show, you have this gorgeous character, Simon Gould, who's played by Tim McKinney. And um, in the last episode, he wins a role in The Crown, which is transformative for him. And there you are in true life, as my children say, it was always like, it's true life. I mean, in true life, you played Martin Bashir in The Crown and you were nominated for a Gold Derby Award. What was it like? I loved it. It's an enormous production. And it's very rare to, as an actor to be in a thing that's just as well considered as that. You know, obviously, it's a kind of iconic show. Um, the story space is iconic. You know, we wanted to sort of really do it justice and really sort of dig in and do it carefully. And and I think, you know, I think we did. It was sort of well rehearsed and, you know, carefully made. and very brilliant professionals in every department. So it's a really amazing, amazing process. I mean, I'm I'm quite a sort of low-key person, I would say. And it's a big show. So that's always something to never quite be prepared enough for, you know. Like Martin Bashir, 
you come from an ethnic minority background, and I read in an interview that you gave that you felt you were skin queer. What did you mean by that? I mean, I guess like that stuff is like, I I don't even know if that's a phrase that is in a kind of public discourse. It's just something that occurred to me just talking to friends of mine who are genderqueer or trans who in talking to them about their experiences of the kind of internal body dissonance, I guess, that you can't immediately put your finger on, but you know something's wrong. And it's a source of kind of internal friction or tension, rather than the sorts of things that don't feel right in you that you know are growing you. And I think if you speak to a lot of third culture kids who move into spaces basically against the colour gradients. And what I mean by that is towards whiteness. You know, you absolutely don't find this in white expat communities. I think there's a kind of ability to hang on to that core identity, basically from a position of privilege. But going the other way, it's not even an instruction or an invitation. It's an instinct that you have to kind of mute your own heritage to kind of fit, you know. And you end up kind of performing the heritage of the space that you find yourself in to try and blend in which is sort of like painting a cactus red you know in the desert and the cactus kind of thinks but i'm i'm sort of i think i'm okay and the other cactuses are like i mean we we can see from miles around you're you're a cactus and we love you but you know that is just a thing that i think a lot of people i mean i find it very hard to talk to my friends about it because i think the level of kind of dissonance is so deep and the level of kind of I guess, adaptation that everyone goes through is so deep that it can be a very violent thing, actually, to bring up a conversation about how people might have muted an internal racial compass. And mainly because the invitation to do that has come from you yourself. So those things can end up feeling like a kind of massive self-betrayal of some kind of longer lineage or older lineage, you know. It can really kind of fracture your relationships with your kind of family's past and so on. Um, And all the sort of little things that you take for granted, like, oh, you know, my grandparents fought in the war. It's like my relatives fought in the war as well. It's not that that one, you know. And so you end up having a history that's non-applicable. So you have to perform the present that you're in. And then later on in life, you kind of think, God, like who's the actual, who's underneath it all? And so I think like those sorts of things are challenging to kind of work out. And in the context of work, what I've really discovered is that there's been like huge strides in terms of, uh, and it's kind of a dread word, but in terms of diversity, because what that sort of ends up being is about the maintenance of a fundamental status quo by kind of colorizing, re-optically engineering the outside of something so if you so if you look at theater it's very easy to make a theater's annual program feel quite diverse but having sat in those meetings it literally does involve people going right well we need we kind of need a brown play kind of need a black play like like who are the great disabled artists like we need to commission someone and it's it's not coming from any actual sense of a multifaceted variously shaped world it's coming from basically a sense of like, if we don't do this, we'll get rumbled and we'll lose our jobs and be cancelled or twist. I'm kind of old enough to have been in the business in the before and the after time where you kind of couldn't get arrested for anything that wasn't basically a show about, you know, like a brown family in a corner shop or an arranged marriage story or something about terrorists through to you know, basically the point where they go, right, we need the brown best friend or we need the brown husband of the white lead or whatever it is. And then out the other side of that is something like 10% where that show, and I'm I'm so grateful to Rachel Freck, who's the casting director of that show. And she also cast Defending the Guilty. And she has been an amazing advocate for me as a comedy actor, which is something, as I said earlier, I don't really see myself as, but her insistence that I auditioned for 10% came from her sense of me being able to do those scripts, you know. And I really do feel the the show's 
that I'm in where I'm just not there to kind of tick a box or fill a gap, you know. And the work that you're doing where you're actually delving deep into a kind of heritage relationship story or, you know, the notion of like heritage dissonance or heritage fracture or the fracture of genuinely global and diverse stories from the story that we've just all been given. Those are phenomenally hard to make, like unbelievably hard to make. So, for example, if you wanted to make a story about the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who served in World War I who weren't white, for example, you just will not find a backer in the television and film of the West that will make that story. And that really is, that's what, that's what inclusive narratives are. What you'll find is someone will throw a brown person into the back of a scene in, you know, a, a war film and be like, we're diverse now. And those two things are really, really different. And so you can really feel like you're enabling a structure that is not moving. It's just bending to survive. And you can feel like you're helping it bend. And so that kind of betrayal of, of self continues if you're not careful. So those are the challenges. If you could change any of it, well, no, what could you change? It's about a national story, really. It's about what we're not prepared to talk about in this country, which is the silent heritage of empire, I guess. Teaching of a multiplicity of empire stories at school is really vital so that these things in later life don't feel like an add-on. But it's no surprise in that, it, on that basis that just statistically speaking, black people are so persecuted by the Mets. It's, a, it's for the Met to decide whether they feel that that's a, an internal kind of issue of institutional racism, which, you know, the McPherson report referred to, but just statistically. And that just doesn't come out of a, an empty field. That comes out of a kind of a landscape of education and understanding that is just woefully incomplete. And so it's no point me kind of going, oh, this is how I would change theatre. That's branch trimming rather than just you know, soil biology. Yeah, and that feels like an overwhelming beast to try yeah, and tackle. It is. I think the minute you see it, you're like, oh, it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a <laughs> yeah. lot, you know. I read your script, The Night Watchman, because I couldn't go, go, go and yeah. see it. Yeah. You have been so busy, not just acting, you've also been writing, you know, directing, and I want to talk about all of those things. And Night Watchman was your debut play, um, which prem premiered at the National Theatre in 2011. And it's about a Sri Lankan female cricketer as she prepares for the innings of her life for England against Sri Lanka at Lords. And it's a monologue. And she's facing a bowling machine. And while she's facing this bowling machine, she's talking about anything other than, well, it's a bit about sport, but there's national pride, there's politics. I mean, you cover so many topics in it. I loved her voice. Where did that come from? I mean, this is a, an interesting case in point. The National were doing a season of plays by writers and directors new to the National Theatre. And this was in the period where the National had War Horse in the West End. So they had a kind of, a chunk of money, I think, that they could invest in new work. And that ended up being The Shed, which was a beautiful fourth space that the National Theatre had, a kind of red wooden box outside the front where all these kind of naughty plays happened. And they were really, like all the kind of really exciting stuff was happening in there. Um, and we were going to do these four plays in the Cottesloe Theatre, as it was called then. And then... Um, a play called London Road opened and did incredibly well and they wanted to extend that in the Cottesloe. So we ended up doing our plays in the scenery dock in the National, the paint frame, it's called. I was, I was working as an actor at the National at the time and basically there was a sort of sense that the group of artists that they were choosing just lacked the kind of visible diversity, frankly, frankly. As soon as I became aware of that, I was like, well, I could just pitch them an idea not because I think they'll do the play, but because it might, they'll definitely read it at that point. You know, sometimes it's just about like, you know, you've got to kind of try and find a way into a conversation. And I thought maybe I could get a bit of time at the National Theatre Studio to develop an idea, but I absolutely don't go anywhere. And um, it's always difficult to talk about complicated sort of heritage stories. And I guess finding a kind of motor to do that or a metaphor to do that is, is a way, you know. And I like the notion of a monologue, sort of curious about it. And 
I think there's something about the kind of intersection of brownness, of the diaspora story, the kind of weird, like, post-Commonwealth metaphor of cricket, and also of women's cricket, frankly, which is this kind of, well, certainly was at the time and, and less so now, but still, it's this needlessly forgotten kind of backwater of sport with a huge following, huge fan base. You know, it's a kind of, it felt like an intersectional space of a number of very interesting minority energies in which, of course, is inevitably going to erupt a kind of anger. I think when you push athletes and artists into spaces of high tension, extraordinary things are revealed, I think. And that was the kind of heart of the play. So I basically wrote a couple of pages of a, of a woman speaking sort of to a bowling machine. But, and um, that was on the Monday. I gave it to the literary department of the National. They commissioned it on the Wednesday. And we were in an audition on the Friday and I hadn't written anything. <laughs> wow, um, that's so exciting. And, uh, and six weeks later, we were in rehearsals. Oh, my goodness. It's an amazing opportunity, but, you know, looking back with the sort of hindsight of 12 years and being an older man now, I kind of can see the, the problems in that as a paradigm of commissioning. Um, because essentially what you're doing is you bring in an artist very last minute without any of the support mechanisms that you might need, particularly someone who's writing about something very, very personal. And none of that support can sort of go around them because... It's every, everything's just happening so fast. And then, you know, the play was indifferently reviewed, but I think it was quite viciously reviewed in, in a way that I think kind of wouldn't happen now because it was trying to do a thing that people didn't understand the backstory of. The play is absolutely, you know, flawed and all of the rest of it, but um, it was kind of swinging a punch, really, rather than writing an essay. And I think in the room, audiences felt that and, and some of the critical reaction to the play kind of understood the nature of that swung punch, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I wasn't commissioned to write another play at the National. And I don't know this, but I'm probably the only debut writer who debuted at the National to not be commissioned to write something else there. So there's an inespa- inescapable feeling of how, your, your usage being expired, you know. Thank you for your service. Goodbye. Fundamentally, it was um, a sort of amazing, weird, magical time where I was in a show at the National in the Olivier. And the show was so long and I, my part in it was so small that I could sort of go down to the paint frame and listen to almost the entirety of that play through the door in my costume. And Stephanie Street, who played Abby in the play, um, who I think was completely revelatory, actually, and had been around for 10 years as an actor, unable to really punch through. And it was really wonderful to give her that platform. And similarly, I think, you know, it's a performance that really should have elevated her into a whole other space. And really, by virtue of the kind of all the things that we've been talking about, somehow, industrially, that failed to happen. And, um, you know, there were sort of strange questions around even casting her because she hadn't pop through in that first 10 years. But of course, there aren't really the roles for women of colour back then. So it was not really, you know, so so all of those things were kind of complicated things to, like, to be looking back at now. But it was a really wonderful production directed by Polly Findlay, who's one of, one of the best directors out there, really. She's absolutely brilliant. Director of new plays and um, brilliant kind of technician as well. And the National really kind of threw themselves behind the production and the uh, the stage crew in the Cottesloe, six or seven lads who every night would sort of turn up with like iron bars and things to like whack the set unseen to sort of generate the sound of a ball ricocheting off the inside of a, you know, Steph wore a speaker so that there was the sound, the unseen ball was, set, was, was heard. You know, it was, a, it was a really wonderful technical kind of um, deft thing. And it was, it, it was exactly as envisaged in the script it was what the script needed so in so many ways it was a kind of real triumph i still owe nick hearn books about 250 pounds of a 500 pound advance so, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, I'll, well, it's not it's not a book that flew off the shelf so i appreciate you <laughs> i really enjoyed it let's go on to what you're doing currently there are yeah. three things that are current let's start with 
Breathtaking, which is going to come out in spring. You have co-written this series with Rachel Clark and Jed Mercurio. Rachel, who also went to New College, and she first of all did PPE, then she went back and studied medicine, became a junior doctor, wrote a couple of books about it, and then wrote Breathtaking about the work in the NHS during the first wave of COVID. Jed Mercurio is legendary for creating (laughs) and writing Line of Duty, and you've had lots of writing collaborations with Jed. You've written a graphic novel together, Sleepers. It's starring Joanne Froggart from Downton Abbey and Liar. She plays the Doctor. I can't wait to watch it. How did you and Jed come together? Well, Jed and I worked together first on a show called Critical, which was a a real-time trauma medicine drama that was um, on Sky about 10 years ago, actually. Jed was the showrunner, writer, and I was playing the anaesthetist on this trauma team. And we were holed up on this set, Long Cross, which is um, out by the M25, And the entire show, except for one day, I think, for me, and a couple of other days for others, was shot in that one bunker, that one studio. And so we had a lot of time to, you know, (laughs) get to know each other. (laughs) And um, uh, in one of the conversations with Jed, um, we were sort of chatting about things. And uh, I'd I'd written a script that had been commissioned by Ben Kingsley about World War I, about the Navy, actually, in World War I. Oh, wow. um, About which I knew nothing until I spoke to Ben about it. And he was interested to read it. Jed has a military background. He was in the Air Force while he was a medical student and, and then a, a bit while he was a junior doctor as well. And he he liked the script and he sort of said, when we finish Critical, let's meet up and talk about you know things to write. And, um, and Sleeper, the graphic novel, came out of that. It was originally conceived as a TV drama, a sci-fi. And uh, we pitched it in California and got a bit of traction around it and started getting it going and eventually thought the best way to just let it exist in the world was to write a comic. And so we worked with Coke Navarro, who I'd previously worked with at the Royal Shakespeare Company. He designed a beautiful poster for me for a show that I directed there. And the three of us basically wrote that book. I've got about probably 20,000 WhatsApp messages on my phone to Coke. I've never met him in person. I, I met him for the first time, spoke to him for the first time vocally and saw him on a Zoom after we'd finished the book. Um, we did the whole thing remotely and, and he's he's one of the most incredible artists I've ever worked with. And that was a really exciting sort of project, particularly because it started as TV and ended up as a book and it's sometimes difficult to bring a thing to any kind of conclusion. So it was really nice to kind of produce something. And Rachel, I knew when she was a medical student, she was, she's, uh, she was a graduate entry medical student and uh, she was on my firm when I was a junior doctor and, and I was in my first year of clinical practice we became friends, actually, and she was um, a little bit older than the other students, very wise, very funny. She was about to have her first child at that time. I remember sort of going around to meet the family, meet her husband, Dave, and um, we stayed in touch and we got back in touch fully around the time of the pandemic. And I was doing some work with a theatre company called Headlong about the experience of healthcare professionals in that first way, the pre-lockdown March 2020 kind of era. Uh, sort of das boot really in the NHS, like uh, um, hugely traumatizing precinct for healthcare professionals at that time. And um, I volunteered to go back in the health service, and they said, "No, thank you." <laughs> so I thought, try, try, <laughs> make some really sort of contribution. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a low point that. But um, and Rachel then had uh, was chronicling her own experience. And that became breathtaking. And she and I had been talking about adapting one of her other books. And we had some conversations and I had a brief conversation with ITV about it. And we sort of were in the kind of like early stages. The pandemic happened and it was just sort of clear that that was the story to tell in the present, you know. And the book wasn't published yet. And so I I, I just sort of thought like it was a sensible thing to do to, to share it with Jed to kind of really kind of add afterburners to the whole thing and just get it going. And Jed was considering writing something, as as you'd imagine he would. Uh, he was considering writing something about the pandemic anyway. So it all kind of locked together. And, and he met with uh, Rachel and I, and we just sort of decided to kind of do it together. And so originally it was going to be a single film, and then we wanted about two parts or four, and we settled on three. Um, so the first part is that pre-lockdown kind of two or three months. Uh, the second part is about a month later, so going into that first summer and um, the kind of biting down of the pandemic. 
And the third part is the sort of um, Christmas, the tears, Christmas and the incomplete lockdowns and the um, the kind of battle, I guess, of the disinformation and how that, that was affecting patients and staff. And uh, yeah, so we just sort of um, put a story together and uh, we shot it in Belfast earlier this year with an incredible cast and crew, brilliant director Craig Viveros. That's uh, due to be out on ITV next uh, next spring, yeah. Spring 2024. Yeah. Very exciting. And then alongside that, you had your first film directing debut, which was also yes. in Northern Ireland, um, Bally Walter, which I watched a couple of nights ago. I was despairing. You made me laugh out loud. I was, and I was hopeful at the end, but hopeful in a non-Hollywood way, in a sort of, this could go either way. A lot of it was sort of, is filmed in the rearview mirror and you have the actress, um, I should actually probably say, it's about a young taxi driver who strikes up a friendship with one of her regular passengers and they're both fighting demons. So Shauna Kerslake sort of reminded me of Daisy Edgar Jones, sort of for such an incredible face and to convey all those emotions in the rear view mirror, I thought was, you know, was really powerful. So um, yeah, a story about human connection, about depression and and how difficult it is to deal with that. But how oh, did thanks that, very much. I appreciate how you. How did that come out? Well, it's, well, it's not just me. You've had great reviews. So Yeah, it was um it was I mean, it took eight years. I've been working with the writer Stacey Gregg for about ten years now, and that film is kind of the culmination of that journey. And we were talking about I guess scales of film and relationship and styles and moods and tones and things that we were interested in. And, and Stacey just sort of went away for over a Christmas period and just and just wrote the first draft of it. Uh, and we worked on it a bit and I brought James Beerman on, who was our lead producer who somehow managed to get this film made across the pandemic. I mean, a, a sort of act of brilliance in producing, I think, really. And how did you manage to do it? Well, it was this is the thing. We sort of had to invent it as we go. And James was kind of at the tip of that particular spear. It was we were one of the early productions out of the pandemic. So we shot towards the end of 2020 into 2021, so pre-vaccine pandemic. Our shoot actually straddled Brexit. So we were shooting in Northern Ireland as the UK left um, the EU. And we obviously, like, we're shooting on the island of Ireland. That's a very porous, creative border. Very porous. And so we were suddenly kind of, you know, having to work out how do we get back to Belfast after a Christmas hiatus, you know, in a pandemic as we Brexited. No one really knew. The Foreign Office didn't know. that. The Home Office didn't know. Like, no one really knew whether we were going to inadvertently contravene a law that hadn't been written yet or something. Do you know what I mean? It was a kind of bewildering, bewildering time, all masked up, absolutely no money. It was a tiny budget film. We spent all of our contingency on COVID precautions. But we did, you know, six, 700 COVID tests. We had one positive. Everyone was perfectly safe. So I'm very, very proud of it as a kind of job say, a saving, creative act. And uh, I'm very proud of the film. I mean, it's uh, I, I, I think it's been seen quite widely in Northern Ireland and uh, and in the Republic of Ireland. And it's done very, very good box office trade there. And I'm, I'm thrilled about that. It's been, it's, it's been a very lively addition to the, the cinema landscape this autumn, I think, which is really nice. Hopefully the next stage for the film will be we can find a, a streamer platform for it so that people can really kind of, you know, get to the film. But um, yeah, it was, it's been an amazing desperate horrendous process <laughs> That's like any, any any kind of uh, any piece of filmmaking is so um we we released that in september the film was long listed for some biffa awards which was nice and so yeah i'm i'm now in the process of kind of going through the kind of creative bereavement i think you've got to let it out in your body and i think with those very very long-term projects you know they really weld themselves to you because you know eight years is a long time you know in anyone's life and so you change over that period. So you, there's a lot of like unshackling that you have to do to like let it go and let yourself go. That's the, the current project. The last of the of the trio, only one episode in, but is the ITV series that you're acting in. So it's yeah. writing, directing and acting, which is payback, new crime yeah. thriller from Jed Mercurio again, where you're the undervalued Financial investigator who I suspect cracks the case, but I don't. <laughs> but I don't know because I haven't seen well, the stick end around. of it. Stick around. <laughs> yeah, I will tune in next week. <laughs> 
Well, I heard Denzel Washington say that luck is when opportunity comes along and you are prepared for it. So using that definition, it seems that you have had a lot of luck and it's fully deserved and you're only getting started. Well, I would agree with you. I think I've been incredibly lucky and I am incredibly lucky. I think like, I mean, frankly, every time I get any kind of job, I feel very, very fortunate. And I think like any creative life lasting years is um, in so many ways a kind of fortunate and triumphant thing. Well, I can't wait to follow the next chapters. And you've been so generous today with your time. So thank oh, well, you thanks so, so much for so talking much. to me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. You've been listening to Bandwidth Conversations. Thanks to Anna B, Head of Marketing, to Matthew Passy and all of the podcast consultant, to Bagawai for the music, to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you for listening. Any feedback, please email me, katie at bandwidthconversations.com. Please sign up on our website, www.bandwidthconversations.com, so we can notify you about new podcast releases. We hope to see you again soon.